This program is brought to you by Emory University. And with that, we're going to get going. So again, welcome to Cardiovascular Grand Rounds. Uh, today we have a, a basic science presentation that's really on the cutting edge of translational uh, uh, science in cardi cardiology. Dr. Nakvi is a, an assistant professor here in the Division of Cardiology. He came to us uh, from the uh, UAB as a postdoctoral fellow, stayed on as instructor and now assistant professor. He's uh, received funding from the American Heart Association in the form of a science, scientist development grant. And the work he's been doing is, I think, really interesting uh, in that it really helps reshape how we think about, one more time, how we think about cardiac repair and regeneration and how hearts grow. And, and the work is, is basic science work, but it has really some very strong translational applications as we think about myocardial repair and regeneration. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Nakvi. Thanks, Bob, for the kind introduction, and good morning, and welcome back after a long break. I hope I can keep you awake <laughs> after the long break. Uh, so as the topic of my talk is, thyroid makes young hearts grow. Uh, so basically, it's... Uh, just to take you first, uh, exactly from the postnatal day 10 in mice, which is uh, just the start of pre-adolescence. Uh, and this is postnatal day 35 heart. This, this is uh, uh, just uh, past puberty or at the start of the puberty. So within these 25 days, there is a rapid uh, body growth, but as well as similar level of heart growth. So it almost matches to that. And so, but the heart function uh, during this unique kind of cardiac hypertrophy where the heart has increased 400% uh, remains pretty much uh, very good. And uh, the cardiac function is uh, all parameters were very good. The stroke volume is increased equally um, matching the heart uh, growth. So we wanted to determine what happens because this is a very unique kind of uh, cardiac hypertrophy, but I won't say it cardiac hypertrophy, it's a unique kind of cardiac growth. And it doesn't happen in any kind of physiological uh, hypertrophy or pathological hypertrophy where the heart has increased 400% within a very short span time. And the heart function remains really good, okay? Uh, at the most, uh, in a, a pathological hypertrophy, like per pressure overload or volume overload, the heart increases by 150% or so. And even in the physiological hypertrophy like uh, uh, pregnancy and exercise, the heart doesn't increase as much, okay? Uh, so looking at the mechanisms, the first thing that came uh, in from a very seminal study from uh, Bill Grossman uh, in uh, almost close, uh, close to half a century ago, what uh, he describes was that in uh, our concept, the eccentric hypertrophy by which a child's heart becomes that of an adult represents a physiological volume overload and may very well utilize the same mechanisms as seen with the physiological volume overload. Uh, so, by, with the pathological volume overload. So, we wanted to test whether this is the case, but I'll show you that it's a little bit more complex than that, but initially, uh, on a general level, yeah, he was right. So, if you look at uh, uh, the cardiac function parameters, uh, from postnatal day 10 to postnatal day 35, the LVEDD increases to fold significantly and end diastolic volume increased 4.6 fold. And also the stroke volume increases and the heart is doing really fine. Uh, length to diameter ratio decreases and H to RI ratio decreases, suggesting that there's, because of there is no um, change in the wall thickness by internal radius increases, so it's an eccentric read modeling of the heart that is occurring in the heart. So, uh, basically looking at this, and then we want to look at what happens at the more uh, cellular or at the genetic level to the heart during this time. Uh, and what is the cause of this uh, um, heart growth, this rapid heart growth during this time. So, 
so the initial concept is that the body weight as the body pain increases after birth the circulatory demands demand drives the heart growth okay so we wanted to see is that the case so if uh, so every day we measure the heart growth of the different liters of mice born from birth to almost a year but i just plotted over here from birth to puberty uh, so if you can see over here that the heart growth really uh, matches the body growth okay and uh, but if you if when we closely look at it if you look at during this time the green dots they are really uh, all of them are above the line of best fit and this is starting from postnatal day 11 just at the start of pre-adolescence and just before weaning in mice okay so during this mid pre-adolescent stage because uh, in mice, the neonatal period ends around uh, P5 in mice, okay? So postnatal day 5 or 7. And so the pre-adolescence starts around P10. So just during this period, uh, there is in addition to circulatory demand, there is something else that is happening that is driving the heart growth more than the body, okay? So we wanted to see in close what is, uh, how, uh, how we can, Delineate, uh, delineate the mechanism, what is happening. So again, this is the heart to body weight ratio that is increasing during this time. And so this is more, heart is growing more than the body, all right? So looking at this time, going from postnatal day 10 to postnatal day 14, as you see the heart is increasing. So, and then we look at what is happening to the cardiac muscle cells themselves in terms of uh, their volume, okay, in terms of their width or the length. Because the, is it the hypertrophy dr is driven by what mechanism to, on, the, on the level of the cells of the heart. And as you can see, there is a minimal change in the heart, uh, the cardiomyocyte width, but there is a, a very significant change in the length of the cardiomyocyte. And another hallmark of the normally pathological hypertrophy of every, any kind is that you see a fetal gene reprogramming which is characterized by ANF uh, uh, increase of, at the mRNA level and also increase in the beta myosin, okay, which is usually expressed in the during fetal stage, all right. But here what we saw was very characteristic that Really, it was opposite that was happening, that alpha myosin, myosin was increasing, which is the fast isoform of the myosin, and uh, it's increasing very highly significantly. But the ANP was not, there was trend, but it not changed uh, significantly. So this was very characteristic that the cell length is increasing, not the cell diameter, which usually happens in the you know, hypertrophy, and also that uh, alpha myosin uh, was increasing the change in the alpha to beta myosin ratio. So when I looked at the literature, so, the, so looking at how, in what situation this can happen. So there is one situation that comes to mind that where actually alpha myosin changes and not the beta in terms of hypertrophy of the heart and that is hyperthyroidism or in the disease of thyroid, uh, thyrotoxicosis where there is increased levels of thyroid hormone and at the same time looking at literature we found that uh, when uh, some researchers tried to put thyroid hormone uh, treatment to the cardiomyocytes the length was increasing so really this uh, asked me to ask the question whether is it thyroid hormone driving this pre-adolescent hypertrophic growth and is there is a change in the thyroid hormone levels and so we looked at the thyroid hormone level as the uh, hypertrophy starts happening just ap after P10. So we looked at from P10 to up to puberty, the thyroid hormone level. And as you can see, there is a six-fold increase in the serum thyroid hormone levels just at the start of the pre-adolescence. Okay? And we can block the synthesis of thyroid hormone with the drug PTU, which blocks the biosynthesis of thyroid hormone from its precursor T4 to T3 and using this dose of PTU which blocks half of the thyroid hormone levels, we completely block this heart growth during pre-adolescence, suggesting that thyroid hormone is involved in the heart growth during pre-adolescence. And even at the genetic level, we block the increase in alpha myosin expression. So 
this was uh, this suggests that thyroid hormone is uh, in, uh, causing uh, the, this thyroid uh, this pre-adolescent heart growth. So just to summarize uh, the first part of the talk, that there is a rapid body growth during uh, pre-adolescence that is matched by the heart growth, and there is increased serum T3 levels and cardiomyocytes length increases, but that the width. And there is increase in alpha to beta myosin chain ratio, and the stroke volume is increased, and the cardiac function remains re really good. And it's the eccentric uh, remodeling of the heart that is occurring, and there is no cardiac dysfunction during this period. So then we want to look what is happening at to the at the, to the cardiac muscle cells. Uh, in look as so the way that, that uh, any organ, or in this case heart, can increase in size is only two ways. One is that uh, it's the constituent, constituent cells, like the, in this case cardiomyocytes, if they can increase in size or they can increase in number. So there are only two ways is an, an organ can increase in size. Like if you can uh, if you increase the size of the cardiomyocytes, it will be like this, that if you can keep the size of the cardiomyocytes the same, but the number increases, all right? But from 100 years, almost uh, close to 100 years, there's this myth or dogma out there that, that the after birth, the cardiomyocyte number don't increase. So you, are, uh, you live with the number that you are born with, okay? So if that is the case, then I thought that the majority of the cardiac hypertrophy or cardiac growth that was occurring during pre-adolescence was due to the increase in the cell volume of, and not due to the cell number. And that's what I wanted to tell. And why that is important? That why, we, why it is important to know that really the cardiomyocyte number doesn't increase. Uh, and that is important for, because of the reason that if we know that the cardiomyocyte number increases then uh, or not, then we know that whether heart has the potential to in add the cardiac muscle cells to the heart after birth. Okay, and that can be very important for many regenerative uh, diseases where you, you can cause cardiac regeneration to occur, such as diseases of hyper, hyperplastic left heart syndrome in the pediatric population, uh, where heart muscle cell growth doesn't happen, or in, after ischemic attack. So, basically I looked at the cell volume during this period and the heart growth. Okay, if you go from postnatal day 10 to postnatal day 35, so there is a fourfold increase in the ventricular weight of the heart. All right, and when you look at the cell volume, the cell volume increased really significantly, but the increase was twofold. So there was really a disparity of twofold that was left behind with this heart growth. So I that made me to think that it must be then coming from the increase in cardiomyocyte number. So that's why the next thing we did. So we look from birth all the way up to one year in life in mice, which is uh, uh, more than 50 years in uh, mice uh, uh, compared to humans uh, uh, on the cardiomyocyte numbers of the heart. And this is a postnatal day one or just after one day after birth of the heart. It's probably smaller than the this drop as you can see and it's very hard to cannulate the aorta of the heart it's really technical challenge and this is the adult heart anyway there we found that there were two growth spurts in terms of uh, cardiomyocyte number increase in the heart the first growth spurt is during uh, p1 to p4 and it that added 30 percent of cardiomyocyte number to the heart and then very surprisingly, we saw a second increase in pre-adolescence, which added 40% of the cardiomyocyte during this P14 to P18 period. And then after that, around from uh, weaning is around P21 in mice. From that onward up to the one year of life in mouse, there was no change in cardiomyocyte number. That means that your number is set during pre-adolescence, long after you are born. Okay. And although we have shown that the number increases, but because this was such a 100-year-old uh, dogma, so we needed to show that uh, reverse now, that the number is increasing, then the cell division must have occurred, all right? And here is a marker for cell division, which is uh, in red, if you can see. And uh, that marks that the 
cardiomyocytes are in mitosis and the green is the marker for alpha sarcomeric actin or to say that these are the cardiomyocytes and as you can see that there is no red in the p14 a postnatal day 14 heart or in the p16 heart and even in the rv of the p15 but really this red or mitosis marker you are seeing only in the p15 lv and majority of it is occurring in the endocardium and very few in the epicardium and this was really characteristic but it shows that there is a, a lot of mitosis or cell division is occurring during this pre-adolescent time and here is a super res image showing, showing again that the, the cardiomyocytes that are positive for the uh, mitosis marker B and uh, the one that are negative so I wanted to, so because we see two different phases of heart growth in terms of cardiomyocytes number and I just want to show you what's the difference between, because there's a very characteristic difference between that heart growth during these two periods of time. So if you look at here, you can see the red, but if you look at more clearly here, this is the aurora B, which is a mitosis marker. So this is over here, and but you can see that the nuclei which uh, in which this aurora B is present is all over the place, okay? But this mitosis marker is not present in the RV and is not present in the epicardium, it's mainly in the endocardial space, okay? And so this is pre-15 heart, P15 heart, this is in during pre-adolescent, okay? But if you look at a neonatal heart, which is P2, just two days after birth, you can see this growth, uh, the mitosis is, Cell division is occurring in the heart everywhere. It's in the RV as well as LV everywhere. It's not localized. So this was really surprising and very interesting phenomenon, which we still have some speculation, but we don't know why uh, it, during pre-adolescence it's a very localized growth of the heart only in the LV subendocardium. So another after last year publish, publication of our study, the problem was that people still don't want to believe. So we were sent our uh, specimens uh, for to a well-known uh, bio, uh, uh, developmental biologist laboratory, Richard Harvey in Australia, to blindedly blind in a blinded manner and to verify our results independently, and we were really uh, satisfied that uh, he could also find in a blinded manner that the cardiomyocyte cell division is occurring, as you can see over here in the cardiomyocytes in the P15 heart and not in the P10 heart. So again indicating that really this is a real phenomenon. And this just published this month. So coming back to that, because I saw that there is the heart growth is linked to thyroid hormone level, that heart cardiac hypertrophy. And I want to see if nature is simple that all, along with heart, must heart growth, the cardiomyocyte numbers themselves are also regulated by the same hormone. So here I can show you again that the heart growth is, if, is completely blocked during this time if you give PTU, the blocker of thyroid hormone biosynthesis. Okay, and but at the same time, this is the cardiomyocyte population growth during the pre-adolescence. And this also is completely blocked by the thyroid hormone blockage. Suggesting that both cardiac hyper, uh, hypertrophic growth as well as cardiac hyperplasia are uh, increase in cardiomyocyte number. Both things are driven by the thyroid hormone during pre-adolescence. So what that we find the thyroid hormone is causing the increase in thyroid, um, cardiomyocyte number or there is a replicative burst. So, in terms of translational point of view, if you will look at that, the main thing is everybody is trying to regenerate the heart after ischemic attack or where there is a loss of muscles. And if this replicative potential of the heart, we don't know whether even if we can today in the adult heart, we can find a mechanism of cardiac muscle cells to replicate. Whether that can translate into regenerative potential, we don't know. Okay, so we really want to test this because over here we had this unique opportunity that we see two windows of replicative heart uh, rep where there is the replicative potential is there 
whether that can translate into regeneration or not if after we give them ischemic attack. So here, as you can show, these two windows are here is the replicative burst, another replicative burst during pre-adolescence. And then just after weaning a pre-21 in mice, there is no change in cardiomyocyte number. So, so I took three different ages of mice, which is P2, which is right in during this replicative burst, and P15 during this replicative burst, and just one week after at P21 mice. And we gave them ischemic injury and check what happens to their regenerative uh, potential or regeneration. So just to summarize because of the lot of data and for sake of time, when we give injury to the P2 mouse heart, we, give, we get 100% regeneration within seven days after injury to the heart. When we give P15 mouse injury, we get 30 to 50% regeneration within seven days, okay? But just after one week at weaning, we give the injury to the mice, the heart doesn't regenerate at all. So we know that these two hearts have equal replicative potential and they are regenerating and this, this, even this regeneration made a significant difference in the ejection fraction, fractional shorting uh, in terms of a cardiac function. But it was really surprising that despite this heart has full replicative potential, but just going from neonatal to pre-adolescent phase, it lost the regenerative potential significantly. So there must be some uh, transition during this transition from neonatal to pre-adolescent period. There must be some inhibitory factors that are coming on board that despite even if we can have replicative potential in the cardiac muscle cells, even in the adult situation, we need to overcome that hurdle. And that is we are working currently to identify the factor that really blocks this regeneration despite that the heart has the replicative potential. So, and just to uh, show you that even in the pediatric population, these, uh, they have tried using thyroid hormone and it does make a difference in terms of therapeutic index uh, uh, and in terms of uh, in, in complex uh, congenital uh, heart patient. And this thyroid hormone is uh, actively being considered now as a therapy uh, for, each, uh, for, the, uh, for, for the heart. And even in the adult situation, uh, last year I uh, interviewed this fellow from Martin Gardis lab for the, our cardiology program and they just published a study which showed that even after ischemic injury in the rest, when they give thyroid hormone that makes a difference in terms of cardiac function as well as uh, cardiac regeneration in terms of uh, infarct size as well as um, uh, non-infarct tissue area was significantly improved. And uh, they think this is because of cardiac regeneration, although they haven't gone further. But uh, Dr. Martin Gardez group in, the, uh, in New York, they are now actively pursuing to use thyroid hormone as a therapy in the adults. Uh, patient population. So what I have shown you so far is that the thyroid, uh, as a result of uh, from the thyroid stimulating hormone, uh, the thyroid hormone releases thyroid, thy uh, thyroid releases thyroid hormone, increases the serum thyroid hormone levels, and that during pre-adolescence caused this uh, heart to grow tremendously, and it is involved with the cardiomyocyte number increase. Okay, and that T3 can be used as a candidate for regenerative therapy in the pediatric population definitely, but also may be possible in the adults. So we wanted to know that what is the mechanism, how thyroid hormone is doing is. There are two reasons for us to know. One is that if we know what is, what is the molecular underpinnings of this uh, uh, thyroid hormone mediated cardiomyocyte proliferation, we can maybe use that as a tool for regenerative therapy. And the second important thing was that just not only we, uh, uh, we have uh, 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 really hit upon many people's toes in terms of uh, uh, breaking this dogma or myth of 100 years old that cardiomyocyte number doesn't increase, but on top of that, the second controversial thing was that we are saying thyroid hormone is doing it. The problem with thyroid hormone doing is it, 
because everybody thinks the thyroid hormone is a really a very metabolic hormone and it's very pro differentiation pro maturation factor that it causes cardiomyocytes sarcomeres to mature and in terms of calcium handling and everything so it and it is inhibitory to proliferative growth or proliferation of the cell so how come here we are saying the thyroid hormone is uh, first of all that there is increase in cardiomyocytes number after birth and secondly thyroid hormone is doing it so we wanted to know how actually thyroid hormone is doing this increase how it is acting as a mitogen rather than a maturation factor so one clue came from our in vivo studies and that was that during the same time that the pre-adolescent the hypertrophic uh, the, the growth uh, pre-adolescent growth was occurring that there was increase in the uh, uh, in one of the very powerful mitogenic factor and that is called IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor 1. That increased specifically during P15, during at the time when the pre-adolescent burst was happening and this is in the heart section, uh, I'm showing that insulin growth factor 1 increases. And we can, uh, when we, and here I show in the western blot that the, its receptor is getting activated and this activation of the receptor is completely blocked when we give PTU or block, block the thyroid hormone biosynthesis. So this was in vivo and but we don't know what is, how actually thyroid hormone is doing this in keys of IGF-1 and secondly what cell type because in vivo there are many cell types in the heart so we don't know whether it's coming from cardiomyocytes or what. So just like you we have uh, going from bed to bench side we went from in vivo to in vitro studies to really delineate mechanism so we isolate the cardiomyocytes from the heart and put them in the cell culture and give them thyroid hormone to see really is it directly thyroid hormone is causing this in uh, uh, in the cardiomyocyte and for sake of time i'll just go through what is our hypothesis and so what we thought think is happening is Thyroid hormone is generating reactive oxygen species, a specific form of reactive oxygen species, which is hydrogen peroxide, that is causing increase in IGF-1 uh, transcription and IGF-1 production, leading to its receptor activation. And then this mitogenic arc gets activated and the cell cycle proteins increase, causing the cell uh, proliferation. So that is our main hypothesis and as you can see over here when we give increasing doses of thyroid hormones we increase the IGF-1 levels and increase the mitogenic arc uh, activation and the cell cycle activity and we can block if we block the receptor by giving the inhibitor of the IGF-1 receptor or the arc inhibitor we completely block this cell cycle activity T3 mediated cell cycle activity. So Next, we wanted to look whether how H2O2 or hydrogen peroxide is being produced by the thyroid hormone. And we think the way it is happening is the thyroid hormone is causing the increase of PGC1 alpha. This is a master regulator of mitochondrial biogenesis. And uh, through a signaling with NERF1 and TFAM, uh, these are the proteins that cause mitochondrial biogenesis to increase and electron transport chain activity to increase in the mitochondria. And a byproduct of electron transport chain activity is superoxide reactive oxygen species and hydrogen peroxide. Okay, and then, uh, and as you can see over here, with the T3 treatment, we can see these proteins increase, and also importantly, the H2O2 is increased. Uh, when we give T3 to the cardiomyocytes, okay? And I just want to point out this thing to you that the levels on which the H2O2 is being produced is 0.5 micromolar. This is very important. This is very low dose. It's not very high dose. And I'll come back to you. So next thing we want to stress that this is T3 when we cause, is causing the H2O2 increase and causing the cell cycle activity. Is it that H2O2 itself is sufficient to cause this cell cycle activity or cardiomyocyte proliferation? So instead of giving thyroid hormone, we give the H2O2 directly to the cells, okay? And as you can see here, that by increasing doses of H2O2, up to 15 micromolar, we see increases in IGF-1 uh, expression. But at very high dose, we kill this expression. And here in the same way, in the western blood at the protein level we show that at very low doses 
the H2O2 causes increase in IGF-1 production and cell cycle activity but at high doses we completely block this and importantly at high doses we don't see at low doses this protein caspase 3 but this comes on board at high doses and this is an executioner of apoptosis or cell death okay so this really tells that at low doses is h2o2 are reactive oxygen reactive oxygen species or ROS that we all know to hate are actually good for the heart are good for the cardiomyocyte but only the problem becomes when they are at higher doses so we we, we need to know so this is the proposed paradigm that we have for this that what is happening is that at low doses from 0.15 to 15 micromolar is more closer to physiological range of H2O2 levels and at that time the H2O2 what it is causing is is causing the cardiomyocyte to produce IGF-1 what this IGF-1 is doing is is doing two things one it is blocking cell death that may be induced by the ROS uh, oxidative damage and also at the same time is causing the uh, through its proliferative mechanism the cell uh, cardiomyocytes to increase cell cycle activity but at higher doses actually you block the IGF-1 synthesis and therefore you uh, increase cell death because now IGF-1 is not there to protect the cell and at the same time you block the cardiomyocyte proliferation and as you can see here that the T3 thyroid hormone produces very low dose H2O2 levels close to this physiological range and here I show you that in the T3 treated cells if we take away the H2O2 scavenge it using this PEC catalase a compound that uh, inactivates H2O2 we completely block cell cycle activity and IGF-1 expression as well as if, if, even if we give IGF-1 neutralizing antibody to block downstream signaling. So it's again suggesting that T3 mediated uh, cardiomyocyte replication requires ROS reactive oxygen species signaling. So just to summarize what thyroid, heart, uh, 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 thyroid gland is doing is producing thyroid hormone that is working on the pre-adolescent heart and that on the cardiomyocyte T3 directly working increasing the reactive oxygen species and that cause uh, insulin like growth factor 1 to increase and that causes the cardiomyocyte replication during this pre-adolescent heart growth. So this was in vitro and everything so now we am going back just like in your case from uh, bench to bedside so in our case it's mice not men. So, so to test that whether so what happened is during the first initial neonatal period, I showed you that there is a 30% increase in cardiomyocytes, so heart has full replicative potential. But the thyroid hormone levels are quite low. So we want to test if we give thyroid hormone at that time and we are now increasing oxidative species in the heart, do we increase, reduce, do we uh, reduce the cardiomyocytes number increase or do we increase the cardiomyocytes number? And is it really dependent on thyroid hormone and the reactive oxygen species that replicative burst in the neonatal period? So we give thyroid hormone at P2 and P3 two days just after birth to these mice and we give the DPI. This DPI is a compound that blocks the generation of H2O2 from the mitochondria as well. So we give that for seven days and P7 at the end of the neonatal period we look at the cardiomyocyte number. And here, as you can see, that this is the cardiomyocyte number at P2. And then, just without the treatment, basically, going from P2 to P7, you get a significant increase in cardiomyocyte number. But if you give thyroid hormone level, you increase it significantly further. And this, uh, and this increase, basal increase in the cardiomyocyte number is completely blocked if you give DPI. And even the T3 mediated is completely blocked with DPI, suggesting that even in vivo, reactive oxygen species are needed for uh, th uh, cardiomyocyte replication uh, 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 in the heart. So, just um, 
uh, this is a very interesting paper that I want to show you, just changing a little bit, but keep it. So what happened is this paper published long time ago in circulation research suggests that what they did was in the hearts, they gave, they make two or three groups of red pups after birth. One with the four pups to the mother and another with the 16 pups, thinking that there will be the four pups will have optimal nutrition and the 16 pups will have restricted nutrition because there is only one mother to feed. And they looked at weaning what happens to cardiac growth in terms of cardiomyocyte number. And what they found very surprisingly was that there was the fast growing rats had 30% increase in cardiomyocyte number compared to the slow growing rats. So this study made two points which everybody ignored. One was that cardiomyocyte number keep increasing after birth, up to weaning in, in the rats at least, in the mammalian heart, and which everybody believed before that, that it, it, it doesn't increase after birth. Second, that cardiomyocyte replicative potential persists long after uh, the, the birth. But another important point that this study didn't address was this when this increase in cardiomyocyte number occurs. That is nutrition is regulating the increase, this increase, the first increase, or is this nutrition is regulating the increase during pre-adolescence? We didn't know that. So here I want to test that whether this nutrition is cause, uh, re regulating this increase or this increase. So here, the mice at the restricted nutrition mice, uh, restricted nutrition mice has 12 pups with the mother in the mice and the four in the optimal nutrition group. Both at P10, which is just at the beginning of pre-adolescence, they look almost identical. And as you can appreciate that optimal nutrition group at weaning in mice looks a little bigger and healthier than the restricted nutrition mice. But importantly, as you can see that the cardiomyocyte number is the same in the restricted and optimal nutrition at P10, just at the beginning of pre-adolescence. But really that pre-adolescent nutrition, malnutrition, suppresses the increase in cardiomyocyte number during pre-adolescence. And very interesting what we found was that actually the nutrition regulates thyroid hormone levels during pre-adolescence. So what next thing I wanted to test was if nutrition is regulating the thyroid hormone levels and in the restrictive nutrition you have less thyroid hormone levels and maybe that is the reason the number is, doesn't change. So I try to rescue the restricted nutrition mice by giving a very transient and very low dose of thyroid hormone uh, levels from P10 to P20 and look at the cardiomyocyte number at P21. And as you can see, thyroid hormone, very low dose, can fully rescue the cardiomyocyte number growth during this period in the restricted nutrition mice. So I showed you that the thyroid hormone is causing increase in cardiomyocyte population growth and the optimal nutrition is required for increase in cardiomyocyte population growth during pre-adolescence. But is it occurring, the pre-adolescent growth in the cardiomyocyte, is it also mediated, this nutrition mediated growth is requires, requires raw signaling? And here I tested that, that in the optimal nutrition mice, I gave DPI, which blocks the generation of ROS, okay? Uh, from P10 to P20, and look at cardiomyocyte number at P21, which is weaning in mice. And as you can see, that reactive oxygen species are really required because DPI completely blocks the increase in cardiomyocyte number in the optimal nutrition mice. Again, indicating that even in the pre-adolescent phase, reactive oxygen species are required for cardiomyocyte number increase. So, just the last slide. So, so the so I just wanted to test that what happens to in long term to if uh, if you have a malnutrition during the pre-adolescence phase. So here to the mice we give they were either on restricted nutrition diet or optimal nutrition diet uh, up to P21, and then from P21, which is weaning in mice, up to adult life. Uh, around piece, uh, 10 weeks old mice, they were all uh, on optimal nutrition, both groups. And I want to test what happens long term to 
the cardiac function and as you can see over here restricted nutrition mice never recover despite the fact uh, they were having optimal nutrition throughout the life afterwards so really pre adolescent nutrition has a long term impact on the heart because if you have less number you have less contractile function and we look at other fractional shorting and other parameters and they also are the same so the next obviously i want to test whether this transient administration of very low dose t3 in the restricted nutrition mice can this rescue these mice for long term for life long uh, period and again the same thing but instead of in the restricted nutrition mice we added the thyroid hormone just for this transient period and then and look at uh, adult and as you can see that thyroid hormone this transient administration can rescue the mice for uh, the lifelong for the cardiac function of the heart so basically to summarize that the heart growth during pre adolescence is governed by thyroid hormone but um, important reactive oxygen species which all we think may be a foe of the heart it may be a friend of the heart it all depends on the context and the levels of the reactive uh, so it's not that you just keep using the antioxidants so much so but you have to have a good levels of oxygen in your cardiovascular system also uh, and that is probably the reason why antioxidant trials didn't work and the second thing is that the active monitoring of thyroid hormone levels during pre adolescence is important thing and that the pre adolescent adolescent nutritional status has long life long impact on cardiac function and with that i would like to thank my main collaborator asan hussain and uh, lin tan the fellow who did uh, the last one and a half year of work on some of the unpublished studies and um, uh, tora who did some of the work in isolated cardiomyocytes to look at cell volume and tor who is probably on honeymoon yet but he did the uh, uh, serum thyroid hormone levels during the pre adolescence and bob taylor's lab helped us with some h2 uh, measurements and also has provided us kindly with this catalyst mice which we are doing ongoing studies during this period and grindling's lab again provided some primers for the uh, for measurements of some reactive oxygen species related uh, genes and also the nox4 knockout mice which we are doing some ongoing studies with them and bob graham in australia his lab and david leffer and john culvert at the uh, emory midtown and david martin at chori in san diego uh, with, and of course my sponsors thank you thanks that's fantastic it's uh, just such a great story and uh, the the later data here with the nutrition is really very interesting um, i'll start out with a question that probably not the most important question, but it's a sort of an intriguing one to me when you show the sort of during the second growth spurt that the mitosis was not uniform across the, the myocardium. It was sort of endocardial uh, predominant. What do you think is going on with that? Is that, a, is that sort of a loading thing? Yeah, or? so it's a kind of will be speculation, yes, at yeah. the moment we are still working on it. So there can be a few things, a combination of few things. So one is that... Uh, as you can, um, in, in terms of geometry of the heart, the endocardial uh, cells, okay, they are, we think, are experiencing more stress, okay. So one factor can be that the stress uh, is more over there, so that is maybe uh, stimulating more cardiomyocytes along with the thyroid hormone. Secondly, we don't know what is the levels of, what is the distribution of the thyroid hormone receptors going from epicardial to endocardial or RV during this time. And thirdly, we don't know what is uh, the gradient of H2O2 that is formed during this time in the heart. Is it more in the endocardial space, there are more H2O2 availability, or T3 is generating more H2O2 over there, or, or compared to epicardial, so we don't know. So there can be a combination of things. And there is a very interesting phenomenon in the heart about uh, not in the heart that we are testing is to do with heart zonation of the heart and that is very well known in the liver and in the brain that 
different zones of the brain or the liver have different replicative potential and regenerative potential after injury. So that may be another thing. How much do we know about the other cells in the heart? Um, is it important, the, their response to IGF and thyroid hormone and the fibroblasts setting up an environment where the cardiomyocytes can divide and form new cells? Great question. So, yeah, we, th that was the whole point. We wanted to test it in vitro, okay? So the other major cell type, uh, non-myocyte cell type in the heart is the cardiac fibroblast, all right? So we did an experiment, and that's exactly what we're trying to... Um, uh, so it's... How do... Okay, so here... So these are the cardiomyocytes, okay? And these are the non-myocytes, fraction, from the same heart, all right? They both cell types express the thyroid hormone receptors, both isoforms, all right? But very importantly, only the IGF-1 is being expressed only after T3 treatment in the cardiomyocytes and not the fibroblast or the non-myocyte fraction. So really, despite the receptors are there, somehow the IGF-1 and cell cycle activity, and you can see that the purity of our preparation is very good. We have mymentin, to show the non-myocytes and which is not present in the myocyte and alpha myosin is present in the myocyte. So really it's maybe something to do with the H2O2 and that's what we are trying to identify right now. The, trans the transcription factor is the missing link. That H2O2 driven transcription factor which is driving the IGF1 expression is probably missing in the non-myocyte cell types of the heart and which is present in the cardiomyocytes. Did I answer your question? Thank you for that talk. Um, so I, I, have, I have a question that maybe you can just help me with. When you showed us the gradient of H2O2, and as I understand it, as a non-basic scientist, you said if it was less than 15 micromolar per... Yes, yes. Um, it was probably physiological and had a positive effect, whereas if it was over 400, it had a deleterious effect in terms of... Um, the effect on cell growth. Um, well, th there's there's a big gap in between in terms of, th have you been able to refine that further? What happens between 15 and 400 uh, micromolar? Okay. Uh, so that's kind of a just a question. I'm just, because H2O2 is obviously such an important molecule and it's kind of fascinating that it could have a, you know, positive and a negative effect. And I just wonder what, what the, could, did you tighten that band where you find where it's deleterious and where it's not. And then I yeah, so questions. very um, important question. So we, we haven't, after the 15 micromolar, we have gone to 30 and we start seeing cell death. But the important thing is uh, the question that we haven't showed you a lot of data over here, that even in the 15 micromolar, in that slide, I showed you the idea of an expression and cell cycle activity and there's no cast base. But when we block the IGF-1 receptor, even at the level of 15 micromolar, we start seeing cell death. So really, if even 15, that's why I showed you that cartoon, that even 15 maybe is over the physiological range. So physiological range to my way is that, but when we give thyroid hormone, it's generating or during pre-adolescence, it's generating around 0.5 micromolar. So it may be 0.5 to 2 micromolar or something, but, uh, but still I'm not sure. But even if the physiological range is 15 micromolar, the reason the cell is protective is because of why it is at the same time H2O2 is doing two things. One, it, it is driving the replication, but it knows it is producing something which can be damaging to the heart. So to take care of that, it is uh, it is uh, it is uh, activating a pathway that is really protective as well as regenerative. So that that's the whole thing. I was just gonna, with regard to the infarction model that you showed, obviously for us clinicians that's very exciting. Um, well, can you speculate a little more as to the clinical potential of thyroid hormone uh, and uh, IGF and other things for yeah. treating infarction yes. and regeneration? Yes. So, uh, what is, I think, exogenous IGF-1 uh, uh, 
giving to the heart after ischemic injury has been shown that when you directly inject IGF-1 to the heart, that gives benefit in terms of uh, cardiac function to the heart after ischemic injury. And in terms of regeneration, I'm not sure, but the paper actually does show that some regeneration occurs, okay? Uh, and the, this, as I was telling you, the group in, uh, uh, in New York, in the rats, they have shown that uh, after injury, uh, when you give thyroid hormone, uh, uh, that gives benefit in terms of uh, infarct size, in terms of non-infarcted area and LV wall thickness. Uh, and they're trying to pursue it in, in the clinic with some doctors over there to give thyroid hormone directly to the patient after ischemic injury. Because what happened is that they believe that heart goes into a hypothyroid state immediately after injury. So maybe thyroid hormone giving is a beneficial in that aspect, this, other than the mechanism that we discovered. Uh, that was really interesting. I understood a lot of it, uh, but not all of it. Uh, so that I get this message straight, is it generally agreed now that uh, regeneration, that, that, uh, that uh, cell number uh, changes over time in human, or is that still a controversial issue? Because uh, it's very convincing from what you said, so I don't want to leave here saying, oh, it's now well proven that uh, uh, myocardium really does uh, regenerate, yes, as I yeah. saw it, yeah. but uh, then I think, okay, well, mostly I was seeing rats, so uh, mice, so tell me, yeah. is it still controversial, so, okay. and so on? Yeah, so great question. That's why it took four years to publish this paper. <laughs> so I had the slides over here, but I probably didn't bring them with me. So just a paper has published uh, four or five months ago in Cell again, uh, showing that in humans, the cardiomyocyte number doesn't increase. But then there was a paper published in the humans using the same heart sample to show that the cardiomyocyte number fourfold increased during the first 10 years of human life, okay? So there is a controversy. But one thing is sure, both studies, and, uh, and the study that says the cardiomyocyte number doesn't increase also showed previously and in this study in, in science, okay, uh, that was published that cardiomyces do replicate and most heart muscle cells are formed during the first 10 years of life and that is the main thesis of their finding and that's uh, present even on their websites that's so really the cardiomyces muscle cells uh, can f are forming during the first 10 years of human life so that is there is no controversy in there okay but one is saying there one study that is saying that as a result of these muscle cells, new muscle cells formed after birth during the first 10 years of pre-adolescence, and as well as we are saying that the number is increasing. Another is saying maybe the death is occurring, but they haven't measured the death, and I don't believe that there is a cell death too much occurring during the first 10 years of life, because that would not be good for the heart. So, so as far as the replicative potential is concerned, yeah, there, there is no controversy that replicative potential is there in the heart. But in terms of number, there is a controversy. So, so Navazish, um, <coughs> nice talk. Uh, one quick question. You know, you, in this slide, you show that um, the IGF-1 releasing activity is not seen in non-myocytes. Um, what I'm interested in is that if you mix the two together, do fibroblasts decrease the IGF-1 producing uh, ability of cardiomyocytes? And we know that cardiomyocyte numbers increase, you know, in the pre-adolescent periods very dramatically. Could that be tempering? Uh, the regenerative potential, having fibroblasts there? So let me, the first part of the question, and the second part I will ask you again, and maybe reach it. So, so we did, uh, before doing the studies like this way, where we really made sure that there is not a single fibroblast there in the, in, in the cell culture. We, we were, we, we had to repeat all these studies just to make sure. 
but we did studies we were probably within there were 10 percent to 15 percent of cardiac fibroblasts were there in the culture and when we give thyroid hormone treatment we still see the increase in igf1 levels so based on that in vitro study i'm uh, i'm i think probably fibroblasts are not inhibiting the uh, igf1 response of t3 but uh, I, I, so the second part of your uh, question is to do whether after injury no yeah. normally mm -hmm. uh, Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the hypothesis, uh, one of the hypotheses put forward by uh, uh, Eric Olson's group was that after birth, that at birth there is no much uh, cardiac fibroblasts in the heart, but within seven to fourteen days the fibroblasts increase. And when they give injury at P1 to the heart, ischemic injury or the cut study that they did, uh, you see a complete regeneration, but at P7 you don't. And one of the hypotheses was that there were two, that one, that cardiomyocytes terminally differentiate or lose their applicative potential. Another is that fibroblasts may be inhibiting the cell proliferation. So it is possible that may be happening, but at the same time, I think uh, as we saw 30 to 50 percent of regenerative uh, cardiac regeneration at the P15 heart when we gave injury. So it, it, it may be that the re uh, inhibition of the almost complete regeneration could be due to fibroblasts or could be due to some immune cells that uh, come in on board during that time and after injury there is immune cell infiltration. They are releasing inhibitory factors that are causing, uh, that are blocking the regeneration. Well, again, thanks so much for Thank a fantastic you. talk. That was really interesting. Thanks so much. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.